everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We will be starting very shortly. We're gonna give everyone a little bit more time to join and we'll be back in just a moment. everyone. My name is Nina, physical therapist and clinical director at our Spears Center for Performing Arts in Times Square. I'd like to welcome back those of you who have attended one of our web other webinars, as well as, as well as welcome those who are joining us for the first time. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to learn with us. For those of you who do not know who we are, Spear is a private outpatient practice that has been around for over 20 years. We currently have 21 locations located all over the New York City area. We have successfully continued to offer in-person care through the COVID-19 pandemic, along with launching Sphere Live for those who are looking to stay in and receive care using our telehealth platform from the comfort of your home. In our clinics, we are strategically going above and beyond the CDC guidelines to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone. You can find more detailed information on those safety measures by visiting our website at spearcenter.com. We are here for you in whichever way makes you feel most comfortable. If you are looking for individualized care, either in the clinic or through telehealth, please reach out to us at your convenience and we'll get you set up for an appointment right away. We are excited to be with you today to discuss common overuse injuries found in, but not limited to, performers how cross-training can reduce overuse injuries and how Pilates can be an effective cross-training option. As you can see, we are coming to you live from our own homes. And although we do not anticipate any technical issues today, please be patient with us should any arise as we navigate working through this technology. Throughout the webinar, we want to hear from you. If you have any questions, please feel free to let us know your thoughts in the Q&A feature. To find where that is, please take a moment to hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen. You will see the Q&A option pop up. That is where you will put questions and we will do our best to adjust as many of them as we can during the webinar. It is best to put questions in the Q&A. If you put questions in the chat feature, we will likely be unable to get to them during this webinar. For those of you who are watching through YouTube Live, we are monitoring the comment section there as well so please feel free to type your questions in. Lastly, there will be times where multiple panelists are on the screen. For the best viewing experience, please select gallery view at the top cor right corner of your Zoom screen, so you will be able to see multiple panelists at one time. So let's talk more about our goals for the day and what we will be covering. So we will start by understanding what constitutes an overuse injury, understand the importance of cross-training for every performer and athlete, learn about the history and current use of Pilates, and finally, review some effective Pilates exercises that can be done in the comfort of your own home. 
Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our team of panelists. We're going to welcome everyone onto the screen now. Hi, everyone. I'm Gwen. I'm Ken. Sebastian. Thank you, Gwen and Ken. And here we have Sebastian as well, who's also a physical therapist and clinical director at our West 67th Street office. He'll be helping us with questions in the Q&A today. Just as a reminder to everyone, it's best to be in gallery view so that you can see everyone at the same time. If you've done that, you should be able to see all four of us right now. All right, great, let's get started. Ken is going to say goodbye for now and Gwen, we'll let you take it away. Hello everyone and welcome to Pilates for Performers. Granted, this does not just, like this is not just geared towards performers. If you are not one, this is for athletes of all levels. So I am just doing this really quick, sorry about that. So what I wanted to do first was just talk about how overuse injuries can occur in performers and athletes. And then we'll dive a little deeper into some of the more common ones. So at any high or competitive level of dance or sport, whatever it may be, athletes tend to practice anywhere from eight to 12 hours a week, which is quite significant. And sometimes it's even more than that. The repetitive movements done during these types of sports uh, require to drill technique, technique, technique. And that continuous drilling can put a lot of stress on soft tissue, uh, which can result in an overuse injury, right? So what we're here to talk about is what that means. To drill this technique, we're looking for proper body mechanics over time. This is necessary to decrease tissue stress and the overuse injury. But when we start to see fatigue, right? So when we start to work eight to 12 hours plus a week, it becomes hard for performers or athletes to maintain correct body mechanics. So when we see repetitive stress, what we're seeing is the muscles aren't able to actually recover in a timely manner. This means between dance lessons, between rehearsals, between sports practices, right? If we're not giving our athletes, our performers enough time between those practices or rehearsals to, to relax, to decompress, what happens is our muscles tend to fatigue a lot faster. And instead of loading a muscle or strengthening a muscle, this starts to stress them. And this can result in injury. So according to a study done by Beasley et al, dancers have the ability to get used to this pain because what happens is our threshold for pain increases. This allows them to push past their pain and even worse, prevents them from seeking out a specialist in a timely manner. And then that's when we start to see um, an overuse injury or something that isn't necessarily traumatic. Um, so if we go into the next slide, let's go ahead and discuss some of the different types of injuries we'll see. The three common areas, I should say, of the body that we'll see injuries are your low back, your knee, and the ankle, right? So mostly lower extremity. In your low back, we'll start to see areas of muscular imbalances or sometimes joint hyper or hypomobility. So now we're talking joints. In the knee, the most common injury we'll see is what we call PFPS, and that's short for patellofemoral pain syndrome. What happens here is there is an imbalance of mus the muscles of the knee, and this creates the kneecap from actually gliding and sliding and moving, or what we call tracking, well in the femoral groove. So that's right at the bottom of your, your femur. Um, it doesn't really track as well as it should. So what happens is this can create inflammation of the cartilage. It can create inflammation of some of the other surrounding structures in the knee itself. And this results in pain. Last but not least, we'll see ankle tendinosis. Now, this is similar to tendinitis, which I feel like a lot of people have heard of. The difference between an itis and an osis is that osis is chronic. So that's exactly what we're talking about now. Overuse injuries are due to chronic uh, inflammation or chronic pain. Two tendons that we'll see this osis in are your Achilles um, and another muscle called your posterior tibialis muscle. So these are really important in our dancers for jumping, for maintaining stability of your arch, but that also goes for runners, for anyone in track, right? So again, this doesn't have to necessarily be honing in on our dancers, but we see a lot of this in anyone that does require power and strength at your foot and ankle. So 
what I want to talk about is what we've seen in terms of the positives of cross training, right? So yeah, perfect. You can go on to the next slide. So these bullets here are results of cross training in particularly dancers. This was a study done showing cross training effects in dancers, but I wouldn't go ahead and suggest that this isn't something that we've seen in other areas of athletes as well. So it decreases your systolic blood pressure over time. It improves your recovery rate over time. And we talked about the importance of recovery for muscles. It decreases your resting heart rate, which we know is very important. It increases your max heart rate. So the ability to uh, get to your max level heart rate. So it improves, improves your aerobic conditioning um, over time. So that's what that last bullet was. Um, so aerobic, aerobic fitness training reduces fatigue and fatigue related injury. So essentially it reduces the ability to have an overuse injury over time. So what I want to do is give it over to my coworker and colleague here, Ken, so that he can go ahead and discuss why or how Pilates can be an effective way of cross training more specifically. All right, folks. So let's start by defining Pilates. What is Pilates? So not everybody may know this, but Pilates is actually named for the creator. His name was Joseph Pilates. So yes, it's named after his actual last name. So I'm opening up with a quote by him. And the quote goes right here. Physical fitness is the first requisite of happiness. Our interpretation of physical fitness is the attainment and maintenance of a uniformly developed body with a sound mind fully capable of naturally, easily, and satisfactorily performing our many and very daily tasks with spontaneous zest and pleasure. Now, I wanted to open up with this quote um, to kind of show how Pilates is a very almost holistic approach to exercise. It's something that encompasses not just your physical health, but your mental health. I'll talk a little bit soon about what that means, but I really love, and we really love and appreciate Pilates as a mode of cross training because of this, all right? So next, let's dive a little bit deeper and talk a little bit more about the history of Pilates, like I mentioned. So like I said, Joseph Pilates created Pilates. <laughs> um, and it's, he actually has a very interesting history. So growing up, um, Joseph Pilates actually experienced uh, multiple health conditions that actually were somewhat debilitating for him. And as a result, as a result of his rehab and everything that he experienced, he actually went on to develop this exercise program by exploring different types of Eastern and Western exercise philosophies. He went on to pursue bodybuilding, gymnastics, and circus performance, which as we can see with some of our movements can uh, that we're going to show you today how that influence kind of came about. And from that, that really fueled his inspiration to not only develop this program for, her, for himself, but to share this knowledge with other folks, because he believed that exercise and movement was key to living a happy and healthy life, like I just talked about. Um, uh, along those lines, he also believed that, you know, these principles were things that should be simple to do, things that should be accessible and things that should apply to your life, right? Some of these movements might look funny, they might look like dance moves, but the strengthening and range of motion benefits that we receive from them can help carry on into other aspects of our life, walking, carrying things, turning around in bed, doing all of the above, right? Um, and now the reason that this practice kind of took off and became very famous amongst dancers is because when he and his wife Clara moved to New York City and established their practice, um, they, where it became um, very popular amongst the dance community. So Balanchine, Graham, you know, these big notable names in the dance world um, found Pilates as a helpful tool. Um, and to explain why, I'm gonna move on and talk about a little bit more about the principles of Pilates. <laughs> so the principles of Pilates, right? So just to clarify, right? Pilates is a large school of exercise that follows this philosophy. I know so far I've been kind of general. Um, but when it comes to Pilates, we use different types of equipment. And if you've ever taken a class, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, right? In Pilates, you have that reformer. It's that kind of giant contraption with the straps and the, uh, the moving um, board or the moving carriage. Looks like, Looks like a torture device, but it's very fun. <laughs> um, we also have the Cadillac, um, but there's also different types of Pilates mat exercises that don't require fancy equipment that we're actually going to review today. So despite there being different modes to perform these movements, they all kind of can be funneled into these main principles here, 
And I'm going to highlight the first six, depending on the instructor you talk to, they might include different types of principles, right? So one of the first and most important principles of Pilates is actually incorporating breath. So it's not just important that we're doing these movements, but it's important that we're engaging our diaphragm, utilizing our breath as a component to that exercise. And this does one of many things. On one hand, it helps ensure that just like in points two and three, we maintain adequate control with these movements, but it also ensures that we're also engaging our di diaphragm and also recruiting our other abdominal muscles that actually help us stabilize, right? A big component of Pilates, a big component of dance and just wellness in general that we tend to focus on a lot of times is proximal control. Proximal meaning close to your body, right? So the stronger we are at our core, at our anchor, at our powerhouse, as it's sometimes called in Pilates, the more easy other activities that utilize our arms, our ankles, our knees uh, can be, okay? So aside from that, uh, again, like I said, it's also important that we have control and precision with these movements. Even though these movements have a dynamic flow about them, it's important that we perform them correctly, which is why um, having guided instruction, coming to PT, or as we'll all, we'll, Gwen and I are gonna show you, having proper cues to kind of facilitate that is very important. And then lastly, um, it's very important to create a good flow with these movements. Oftentimes when you take a Pilates class, whether it be reformer or mat, we'll see a certain flow throughout the entire course between exercises, but we'll also see a flow between each of the sets and the reps that you perform as we want them to be steady and controlled. Um, so in general, you know, these are kind of what define Pilates exercises. And we're going to show you a couple foundational ones that are very common, uh, common ones that we actually use a lot of the times when we're treating our clients as well. Um, but you can also see how for dancers, this is very important, right? I feel as though, um, you know, these are principles that we also aspire to maintain throughout a lot of choreogra oh, choreography, choreography, um, <laughs> amongst dance for her. All right, so with that being said, let's talk about benefits. Um, just like Gwen had mentioned with cross-training, um, Pilates has specific benefits. Um, these bullet points were drawn from a study by Lowe et al. in 2018. All you need to know is after they examined these dancers and kind of saw how they responded to uh, Pilates training, they found postural improvements. Um, they found increased flexibility for these dancers, increased postural strength, and better core engagement, okay? So that can lead us to having some fun, everybody. So let's get moving. So hi, everybody. <laughs> so, disclaimer, um, we highly encourage you all to try these exercises at home. Hopefully, you'll be able to see Gwen on our demo screen soon. So when performing these at home, what you want to do is find a nice open space um, if you have any pre-existing injuries, please listen to your body. You can definitely modify a lot of the movements that we do today. And we often do that in the clinic to either progress them or regress them, depending on how you present. Okay. But we're essentially going to do nine movements or nine exercises. <laughs> Emphasizing Gwen is ready. She's getting psyched up. Um, to emphasize those three different joint areas, the back, the knee, and the ankle that Gwen highlighted us for us in the beginning, okay? So let's start with back specific, and I use specific in air quotes because a lot of Pilates movements are whole body, right? And that's why we love them as a cross-training option because even though we might be working core, supporting our back, we're stretching our legs, we're doing using our arms and doing all of the above. So we're gonna start with a foundational version of what's called the 100 in Pilates, okay? And so those of you taking Pilates are probably very familiar with this. This is a core specific ish exercise. And we're gonna get started um, in the same position that Gwen is showing us right now. Um, she's starting out just laying down, hands at her sides. Her knees are bent, feet are nice and planted. Her knees are almost shoulder width apart, okay? So to prep for this exercise, what you wanna make sure that you do is find your powerhouse, find your core. And in order to do so, one of the cues that we like to use in the clinic is thinking about flattening your low back against the mat, pressing your low back into the mat as you draw in your belly button to your spine, bringing your abdomen in. And sometimes something that can help you off the bat when you're getting started and you've never done this before 
is taking a nice breath in, exhaling out, and engaging those cues that we just talked about. And at the tail end of the breath, that's when you should feel the biggest amount of contraction, right? All right, so let's move on. Now let's get into the actual exercise. So that was the prep. So Gwen is gonna start with her arms over her head. All right, and um, let's go a little bit further. So towards the wall, I should say, thank you. I'm gonna have, we're gonna have Gwen show you um, a kind of progression. So rather than keep her knees where they are, Gwen is actually gonna move her feet into a tabletop position or a 90-90 position. She has great, excellent core strength. So this is no problem for her. From here, Gwen is going to pretend as if she has like a tangerine or a small fruit uh, between her chin and her chest. So she's gonna essentially tuck her chin and support her neck that way. And the movement here is she's going to lift her head, keeping that chin tucked as her arms come down by her side and she reaches away towards the wall. And from here, Gwen is gonna start pulsing her arms keeping everything nice and still, core is engaged. She is inhaling on a count of five, exhaling on a count of five, and repeating until we get to 100, that's the name of this exercise. We can definitely modify this depending on kind of where you are in your fitness or Pilates journey. Um, but this is the idea, remember to inhale in on a count of five, exhale out on a count of five until we get to 100, and then you're going to reset into the same position. Excellent job, everybody. Give yourselves a round of applause, Gwen. Thank you. Amazing. How are you doing, Gwen? Core is engaged. If, in case you didn't hear, Gwen said that her core is engaged. All right. So moving on to exercise two of three for the back, we're going to move on to something called a double leg stretch. Now in Pilates, there's also a single leg stretch. These are actually also exercises that we can perform at the Pilates Reformer. But on the mat, we're gonna do this exercise that can provide a gentle stretching of your low back muscles, as well as your leg muscles. And yes, we are using your core, okay? So with Gwen laying in that same position, she is now going to hug her knees to her chest. Excellent. Again, keep thinking about keeping low back, mm -hmm, press into the mat, her chin is tucked. From here, she is going to extend both of her legs up to there, and then she's going to bring them up to the ceiling as her arms move down into that similar hundreds position. She's doing this on an inhale, and then she's going to exhale as she hugs her knees back into her chest and relax back down. Excellent, so let's do that together, everybody. Two more times, <laughs> let's do it two more times. So again, we're going to repeat that sequence. So Gwen, get into that starting cradled position here. As Gwen inhales, she's going to extend her legs and then bring them up to the ceiling, arms down at her sides, reaching away towards her, good. And then on a nice exhale, she's going to hug them and relax. And let's repeat that one last time to send it home. Hopefully I'm not going too fast for anybody out there, but if we have dancers, I know you're all gonna pick it up like that. <laughs> All right, so let's try this again. One last time, inhale in. Good, good. Exhale, relax. Amazing, and you can relax back down. <laughs> Gwen is doing great, you're all doing great. If I could see you all, I'm sure you're all smiling. Okay, so the next exercise we're going to do is called a saw. So this is a good mobility exercise for stretching those low back muscles in a gentle way, but also to work our hamstrings, our hammies, the muscles on the back of our thighs. So in order to get started, Gwen is going to sit up. Exactly. Her legs will be separated in almost a wide V position. Excellent. Her knees and toes will be aligned, pointing towards the ceiling. Very good. Her arms out towards her side like a T, okay, perfect. Just a quick adjustment here, excellent. So I'll move, review the movement and then I'll talk about where the breath is going. So essentially Gwen is going to rotate or twist her body gently in one direction, one direction. And then from here, Gwen is gonna take her right arm and reach towards her opposite foot. 
Exactly. She's going to come back to center, twist the other direction. Now her left arm is moving towards her right foot as she's relaxing her head back down. So two important things with this movement. Again, with Pilates, we're thinking about abdominal engagement or powerhouse engagement. We're thinking about elongating ourselves. So if you ever taken a ballet class or other dance class, right? We think of that puppet analogy. You want to lift, maintain that excellent posture, finding your center. So I, we're just gonna have Gwen repeat that a couple more times with a different view, excellent. So you want to inhale, sit tall. You're gonna twist and exhale as you bend forward, collapse, good. Inhale, sit tall, elongate, work that powerhouse, everyone. Twist, exhale, relax. All righty, everybody, great job. So that was the saw exercise. Okay. So now we have addressed three exercises to somewhat address the back. Now let's talk about the knee. So oftentimes when we think about treating or working or rehabbing a joint, we like to look again, joints above and below. So in this case, we're gonna start with an exercise called a shoulder bridge. So Gwen is gonna get back into that supine position or that laying down position. Her feet will be bent as such, excellent. And there's two very vari multiple variations of this exercise, but we're going to start with a variation where your arms are down at your side. So if you've ever done a bridge, that is precisely what we're going to be doing. So thinking about engaging that powerhouse, engaging the core, like we practiced in the very beginning of the session, you want to make sure that's nice and, and um, engaged. And Gwen is now going to drive her feet into the mat as she lifts and rolls up her hips up towards the ceiling, excellent. Now this is a difficult variation, but if you can continue on, I encourage you to safely. From here, Gwen is going to extend one of her knees. And this is actually the starting position of this exercise. She's then going to lift her leg up. She's going to bring it back down. And she's gonna do that two more times while her feet are pointed and reaching away from her. Excellent. You can relax that leg back down, relax the bridge. Let's repeat that on the other side. So like I said, um, breath is important. So with this exercise, uh, we want, I want you to inhale as the leg lifts up. So exactly, we're gonna extend the other leg this time. Inhale as we raise, exhale as we lower. Good, let's do that two more times. Inhale as we raise, exhale as we lower and relax back down, please. Excellent job. All right. <laughs> Gwen, Gwen just said she almost did an extra one. So you know, this is fun, everybody. <laughs> All righty, moving on to our next exercise. We're gonna do what's known as a side kick, okay? So Gwen is now going to roll onto her side comfortably. Her one arm will be propped underneath her head, other hand exactly in that position. So this is a great beginner way to start the exercise, okay? So making sure to straighten your lower leg as well, the leg on the mat, okay? And then from here, again, engaging the powerhouse, making sure that your hips are nice and stacked, your shoulders are nice and stacked, as if you were laying against a wall. One is now going to perform a front kick in front of her. So her foot is actually moving towards her face because she has amazing flexibility. Years of dance training, everybody. And she's gonna bring it back and extend behind her slightly. Excellent. Making sure that your toes or your, the front part of your foot is facing towards the ceiling a little bit, heels toward the ground. So for our dancers, just a little bit of turnout with this exercise, feet pointed. Exactly. Let's do that. Three more times, inhale with the kick, exhale with the kick back. Good, two more times, inhale with the kick. Powerhouse is engaged, folks. If you find your lower trunk is tilting, you've gone too far and we just need to re-engage that powerhouse. Excellent, one more time, one, two. Gwen hates me at this point. <laughs> Good. Great job. All right, folks, last, Lenny exercise is 
the chair, okay? So for those of you that have ever performed a wall sit before, um, this is very similar. And we're just gonna have Gwen adjust our camera a little bit here, excellent. So what you wanna do, feet a little bit further away from you, okay? Before we even get into a sitting position against a wall, okay? What you wanna think about again is that postural awareness, making sure that the back of your shoulder blades, if possible, are touching the wall, making sure the back of your head is touching the wall, the back of your hips are touching the wall, and you wanna make sure you're not overly rounded and also making sure that you're not hyper extended, meaning you don't wanna be in that military position. You don't want your ribs protruding. You want everything to be nice and stacked in a very natural way, okay? So from here, uh, Gwen is just going to lower herself against the wall close to kind of a chair's height. So kind of 90 degrees, right? And from here, her arms are gonna be up in front of her like a zombie. So if you can just hold this position for three breaths, excellent, that's all you need to do. And then we'll stand back up, perfect. But as a variation of this, what you can also do is Gwen's gonna get back to that same position, maintaining the same powerhouse muscle as before, same postural cues. What she's going to do now is kick slowly one leg out in front of her. Excellent, back down, other side. Excellent, back down, perfect. And then she's going to rise back up, perfect. So these exercises that we give you, you know, again, these are introductory movements that we'd love for you to try. Granted, this is not all encompassing and we're showing you a couple progressions and regressions for you to try at home after this webinar is complete, okay? Lastly, let's tackle the foot and ankle. I think our favorite joints to kind of work with. <laughs> um, so let's do this. So now Gwen is going to demonstrate multiple things. We're gonna look at doming. We're gonna look at toga. And we're gonna show you how to combine it all together. All right. So let's do this. Let's start with toga. Let's start with toga. Let's Whatever start with toga. Want. So we'll start with toga. So toga, folks, is very interesting, right? When we think about moving our feet and dancing, we don't always think about our toes, right? They're small, like what do they do? But our great toes and all of our toes are really important in terms of maintaining stability and helping us develop that power and helping us push off of the ground. And it's not very often that we usually articulate them, right? Because we spend most of the days with our feet stuffed in the shoe and then we take them out and we're like, why are my feet so sore? So one of the exercises that we love to do is called toga or toe yoga, okay? And in Pilates, even though this might not be an isolated exercise, these are principles that we can kind of carry over into the other standing exercises that we can progress to, okay? So when I talk toga, there's multiple things to do, but we're just gonna demo an easy variation you can do. So with all of your feet touching, all of your feet, both of your feet touching the ground, all of your toes touching the ground, you're going to essentially isolate the big toe by lifting them up towards the ceiling as your other four toes press into the ground. We're gonna hold. And then on an exhale, we can press now the great toe or the big toes down into the ground. And if possible, lift those other toes up. Excellent. And we're just gonna repeat that again. Inhale and reverse. So much more challenging. <laughs> and that is, that's a good point. So you may find because we're doing exercises in both of your body, uh, like both sides, you might find one side might be stronger than the other. That's okay. It shows us there might be room for improvement. Excellent. Let's just repeat that two more times to send it home, folks. Good. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Gwen, you can relax. Okay. Next, let's review an exercise that we've talked about. It's called doming, which is also another word for raising your medial arch or the arch that Gwen is demonstrating here. And we often talk about, right, our arches in dance or otherwise. Now, aside from being an aesthetic part of a foot, right, it's mostly important because your medial arch and your position of your foot can also affect the impact that the other joints in your body experience, whether it's your ankle or your knee or your hip. They also help to strengthen a lot of the muscles that actually cross your ankle joint, as well as strengthen the muscles inside of your actual foot, okay? 
This is also something that all, very much so can help with balance as well. So Gwen is showing us here. So just to clarify, um, doming is a very subtle movement, okay? What you wanna do is pretend as if you were going to scrunch a towel underneath your foot. But the important thing being, you actually wanna keep the ball or like the knuckle of your toes on, in contact with the ground. So it's a very subtle movement, but you're almost gonna feel that kind of same like scrunchy movement, almost thinking that again with the previous exercise, like you're gripping the floor with your toes, the balls of your feet are staying in contact with the ground and your medial arch just raises just a little bit. Excellent. And you can relax back down. So that's the foundation of doming. And if you ever worked with me or Gwen in the clinic, you'll always hear us saying, dome, dome more. <laughs> um, so that's what we would like to utilize. So now let's carry that over with something more challenging, okay? So now working into balance, ankle stability, we're gonna have Gwen show just a couple of variations of how we can use doming to her benefit, right? So standing on one leg, Gwen is just going to dome one foot and we could just work on single leg balance from here. She's just gonna lift the other foot behind her like a flamingo. And we can hold this for 30 seconds at a time. Or alternatively, we can add a movement, right? We, her other leg can go into a passe. We can do what we like to call resisted half moons or like a modified rond de jambe. So she's still maintaining the doming. And even though this is an ab specific, she is actively engaging her powerhouse, her abdominals, her core, her body is nice and aligned. But now there's a little bit more emphasis on foot. Excellent, thank you, Gwen. And then the last exercise we have is a variation of a calf or heel raise. So maintaining a V position. So essentially ankles together with a little bit of turnout. Gwen is going to then grip the floor with her toes, but now she's going to lift her heels up off of the ground. Excellent. Coming on to releve, and then she's going to slowly lower them. So at the Pilates Reformer, this is actually something that we like to do sometimes using the bar. And even though we're in a weight-bearing position now, this is definitely something that can be performed in a non-weight-bearing position. Um, whether it's out of Pilates Reformer or if you're doing it laying down against a wall. Excellent. Perfect. And let's just do one more for good measure. Very good, everybody. So that was a lot of movements. Hopefully you all had fun with that. But with that, that concludes our beginner's kind of introductory introduction to Pilates and physical therapy. Thank you so much, Karen and Gwen, for sharing such valuable information on the importance of cross training and reviewing some Pilates exercises that we can do at home. I had a few questions that came up during the presentation. Um, can hundreds be modified if you have a weak neck? And in conjunction with that, someone else had also asked um, if you could re demonstrate the tangerine under the chin. Um, they couldn't see if your head was off of the ground toward the abdomen or if it was resting on the ground with the chin tucked. Okay, so good question. Um, in general, if you were to ever have any questions about your body and something you're experiencing, my number, our number one advice is always to see a professional like PTs. Um, but however, something that can definitely help stabilize that neck actually with that lift off of that movement is that tangerine aspect, okay? So I'm gonna demonstrate here a little bit. I think if we don't mind turning the demo laptop back on, I can get a little closer to that camera so you can get a better visual of what I did. Um, so if we could turn the demo camera back on. Perfect, I have to do that. Here we go. Yeah. So essentially um, the tangerine motion, right? Like it's here and here. And what Gwen is going to do is she's going to tuck that in. So like imagine like a fist, right? Mm -hmm. A fist here. A fist there, good. Squeezing that down. But when she goes to lift for that hundreds activity, she's keeping that tangerine or that fist squeezed. That's gonna help us recruit those deep neck flexors, the abs of the neck, and that'll help better support you throughout the movement. 
Something else that can also be beneficial is think about you're not really doing an ab crunch. You're just moving high enough off the ground that your shoulder blades just lift off. And that's that. And then you're just going to come back down. If your neck does not have the endurance to hold that full hundreds count, you can split it up, come up, five oscillations, come back down and relax. That way you can just give your neck muscles a little bit of a chance to breathe. And I think that if you don't mind snowballing off of that, if you feel uncomfortable lifting your neck, if you have a history of neck pain, you can always just maintain that tangerine tuck and keeping your head flat on the floor. You know, don't really need to, to lift it. I think that even just lifting the legs mm -hmm. with the head in that position would still give you the benefit of the hundreds. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. Um, another uh, person had asked, what is a modification for the saw if I can't maintain an upright posture? Hmm. Good question, and I'm thinking about it now. If we can't maintain an upright posture, I have, I have yeah. one suggestion. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think a good way to do it would be to maybe do it against the wall. Mm -hmm. So you can have the wall supporting you in that moment. That would be essentially like a regression from the same exercise. Might be a little challenging to like if you're if you're rotating to the right, that right arm might have a little difficulty. It's going to be smacking into the wall. Maybe bring it by your side. If you're rotating to the right, does that Nini, I see you questioning it. So I want to make sure that makes sense. <laughs> no, you're good. I was just trying to think if there was any other modifications that I could think of. I think this is a great question because a lot of people who have um, difficulty even just sitting in that long sitting position, right? If they have yeah. tight hamstrings, you know, what other things can we do to try to improve the length? So I love the, the uh, modification that you gave. I'm also even wondering if we keep our legs slightly bent. Yeah. If that would be a good one too. It kind of depends on um, really it's what's preventing. helping us from maintaining that upright posture. Is it because of tightness in our legs or does it have right. to do something in our in our upper body? So um, I love yeah. the, the option that you gave, but hopefully depending on, you know, what's specific to, to the person that had asked this question, we have to figure out what is what it is that's limiting you um, yeah. with maintaining that upright position. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you guys. Um, someone else had also asked, um, with regards to Pilates exercises, how many sets and repetitions uh, do you recommend that we all complete at home? So I would say the general for some, most of these, aside from the hundreds, performing anywhere, uh, like three sets of eight to 10 repetitions would be a good goal to have. That being said, you want to keep in mind the like endurance capacity that you have, making sure again, right, we talked about the principles of Pilates, it's important that you maintain that good form. So if you're just starting out, and you're realizing, you know, I can only make it to rep six, before I realize I'm just losing the form, then let's just cap it at rep six. However, as a general rule of thumb, if you have the endurance for it, three sets of eight to 10 reps would be a good place to start. Um, how do you keep your balance when doing the foot exercises? Any recommendations? So, the foot exercises, the toe yoga, right? The toe yoga, the jome, they aren't balanced exercises. Don't hesitate to maybe start seated, get the movement first, and then say, hey, I'm ready. I think that I could probably stand. The way that I kind of see it, and can I, you can uh, chime in too if this is similar, is a little easier when you're sitting and it's almost like a progression. It's like adding a little bit of weight to the dome and to the toe yoga when you're standing. So maybe start in a seated position first, finalize, really, really get that movement down with the concentration and, and the effort behind it, and then go ahead and rise up. And if you need to hold on to a countertop or to a wall, don't hesitate to. Um, and anytime we do balance, I always suggest ho hovering your fingertips over something so that you're not fearful of losing your balance and you can, you know, you can tap down when you need to, to regain that balance back. Great. Thank you. Um, someone had also asked if you could re-demonstrate um, the chair exercise up against the wall and lifting up your leg. They had a little bit of difficulty with uh, replicating that movement. At home. It's very hard. 
I don't know if anybody noticed it. <laughs> I had a little mini break and I might have scooted my booty up a little bit. The lower you are, the more challenging it becomes. So I will be happy to demonstrate it, but I would even suggest not going to 90 degrees if this is the first time you're doing it. So Ken, why don't we start with like 45 degrees yeah. and I'll go ahead and demonstrate that again. All right, so we're gonna refocus to the demo screen. Hello again. What is back? So this time, just like one mentioned, let's try this again. Again, you want to think about posturally, right? You want to think your hip shoulders and the back of your head are in contact in, with the wall if possible. This time, Gwen, let's show, she's going to show us a variation where we only go to 45 degrees, so half of that chair. And even this would be a safe place to start. Arms outstretched in front of her, okay? So if you feel confident in this position, then that's when we'll add the extra leg movement. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can hear me. So yeah. I'm shifting my weight mm -hmm. a little bit more onto that left side so I can lift the leg. Yep. So in case you couldn't hear, Gwen was just saying how she's using her control to shift her weight onto her leg that is standing. That way she can offset the weight and more easily kick out the other. An alternative to this is if you do the same weight shifting technique one was just demonstrating, but you just lift the heel up a little bit off of the ground. That way we can kind of have an in-between, yes, excellent, and come back. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. I like the modification there. That was, I think, really good, especially if we're having a hard time with lifting up our leg completely. Even just doing a heel raise without the lift bump, I think is a great option as you work towards getting stronger. And then once you're able to do that comfortably, then straighten out that leg and should be easier than kind of how it feels now. So thank you guys for that. Um, so thank you both really for answering all of our questions. Um, oops, someone just threw in another one. What is the chair exercise for? It's for everything. <laughs> the chair exercise, uh, like I said, with a lot of these Pilates movements, it does recruit a lot of muscles. I would say this one's more of a quad dominant, um, if anything. Um, that being said, you're still working your postural strength. You're still engaging those powerhouse abdominal muscles to kind of keep you upright as well. And even just against gravity, your arms out in front of you, you're even using some of your upper arm muscles slightly as well. Uh, we reviewed three different areas of injury earlier in the, in the lecture. And so one of them being, you know, the knee, we have something called uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome. And this is a great way we talked about the mouth tracking or the way that the kneecap just sometimes with muscular imbalances won't move properly. This is a great way to remind that kneecap of how it's supposed to move. So shifting your weight over, that puts a lot of weight through that weight bearing leg, right? That's strengthening it, but you're getting just as much strength through that lifting leg by contracting that quad and getting that patella to move forward and back up and down. So it's kind of like a double whammy, right? We're getting stability through one leg, but we're getting that uh, muscular control through the lifting leg. So it, it's like Ken said, very, very well-rounded when it comes to that knee. I honestly feel like a lot of the exercises that you had shown us today, you guys, was really very well-rounded, you know, engaging your core while doing the toga, you know, is one way to really try to incorporate full body versus being um, too isolated. So thank you guys for sharing all of those exercises with us. Um, so I think that's all the time that we have for today to answer some of our questions. Um, we hope that today's talk was valuable and that you understood more about Pilates as a form of cross training. If we didn't get to your question, we will do our best to reach out to you directly afterward. Um, as a reminder, uh, we will be, this webinar is recorded. Um, so you can always go back and um, look us up on YouTube to see it again. Um, your presenters for today were Ken and Gwen. So feel free to jot down their contact information so you can reach out to them directly with any questions and or to schedule an appointment. Again, my name is Nina and our Q&A moderator was Sebastian. Feel free to reach out to us as well with any questions. And we'd also be happy to facilitate getting you set up with one of our great therapists. 
at SPEAR, we treat an array of conditions from head to toe. And as a reminder, we're open for in-person visits as well as for telehealth sessions. Should you feel that you could benefit from some individualized guidance and treatment, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us individually, and we will personally coordinate you being set up with one of our team members for an evaluation. Lastly, at SPEAR, we will continue to host webinars throughout 2021, covering a variety of topics. So we look forward to seeing you there. Please follow us on social media and check your inboxes to learn more about upcoming topics and the schedule. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. We hope that you enjoyed our webinar and we wish you all the best. Bye everyone, Bye. thank you so much.